What's going on guys? Welcome to another episode of Dispersing the Cloud. We are on episode 55. Uh, this is at the third episode of 2018. <clears throat> Some things have changed again. Uh, if you watched the last episode, I know I was playing catch up. This episode is January 15th on um, for that week. Um, I move out to Missouri and um, I am here. So this week, uh, a lot of it was spent driving, uh, making my initial drop out here and uh, getting everything set up and uh, dealing with uh, being away from family and just getting everything set, man. It's been like pulling teeth. Um, I'm setting up my new office and setting up actually a studio for us to shoot out of. We're going to go live videos here in a couple weeks. Um, and those are going to be live videos with guests and multiple camera angles. And there's a lot of things to do on the podcast in Operation Double Down. Me starting my full time job here pretty soon, um, along with a part time job, along with um, some other projects and books and albums and um, a million different things. And um, yeah, just a lot going on in my life. But did read a book this week, and it was Do Hard Things by Alex and Brett Harris. This is actually a book for teenagers, written by teenagers. Um, I forget who, I forget how it came, oh, this came up from Grit. Um, the book Grit by Angela Duckworth. A great book, five-star book, read it a couple weeks ago. Um, and um, she mentioned these two kids. I think that's where they came up, and that's how they got on my radar. Um, this book was amazing, man. I wish I would have read this uh, when they wrote it. I think they wrote it back in like 2007 or something like that when they were teenagers. Uh, I wish I had something like this when I was a teenager. Luckily, I had sports, and it kind of gave me some of the same um, training that they're talking about. But let me just go through, and um, if you guys aren't familiar with the show, how it works is I read a book. I pick out some of my favorite quotes. I talk about the book. That way you guys don't have to read the whole thing. Um, so they have this saying. It's called join the revolution. Teens rebelling against mediocrity. Um, we, Especially in this country, we have this idea of teens not being able to contribute. You know, you're just a teenager. Um, this wasn't the first... Uh, were the first quote that I wrote down, but I want to lead with this. The word teenager has only been around for 70 years. It's not very long, you know? Um, if you have, I mean, I'm, I'm 30, I'm turning 33, and my father is in his late 60s. So teenager, I mean, was really, they came up with teenager just before he was born. Um, that's insane to me. That word didn't even exist before before he was born. That's that's crazy. Um, they told a story of George Washington. George Washington was captain of a boat when he was 11 years old. Um, he actually got into an argument with his first mate, and he sent his first mate down below and said if he came up, he was going to shoot him dead and throw him overboard. This is as an 11 year old with a clearly a frontal cortex that's not fully developed yet. We know that now, <laughs> but. He still was considered to be a young man, a young man who's a captain of this vessel. Um, that's insane to me. When we think about the level of responsibility that our teenagers have now is so much less than that. I mean, immensely less than that. Um, the teen years are not a vacation of resp from responsibility. They are a training ground the for the future leaders who dare to be responsible now? Um, a lot of a lot of teens like myself didn't have to work when we were younger. Matter of fact, um, that whole thing of teenager not being a word and it it coming into effect is when we changed labor laws, right? We changed the labor laws to where teenagers couldn't work or young adults couldn't work. They, you were either a child or an adult. There was nothing in between, um, and so. They made this teen thing, you know. It's the um, it's a cadult. Uh, well, you get cadults when you don't do this, but 
um, they made this teen area area where you're not an adult, but you're not a kid anymore, and you're like in this weird limbo area, and we don't want to put too much responsibility on you. There were some uh, there were some uh, tips on Google, like how to what chores should your teenager be doing, like what should they be doing, and um, it, was, it was things like make your bed, clean your room, do the dishes, um, super simple stuff take out the trash and then at the bottom it was like and parents don't be too hard on your kids if they can't do all of this that's that's not that much um that's an that's an everyday that's an everyday deal um so these two kids uh alex and brett they actually at 17 um they started this website they grew it um, all about challenging teenagers to think differently and, and do bigger things and um, basically as a conversation piece and they blew up um, they they got to the point where they're getting thousands and thousands of emails they don't know how to manage it so then now they're teenagers and they're just managing a company you know on their own they got their sister involved and they hired their parents to help them out um, they I think it was the governor of Alabama maybe contacted them and was like, hey, I want you to come out and run my campaign. They're like, oh, I must not know we're 17. He's like, no, I know you're 17. Like, that's why I want you to come out. Uh, they ran, they did all the grassroots events, and they told the story of this girl. Um, I forget her name. I want to say her name. We'll just call her Jan. And they were asking a lot of Jan, and they were like, man, if we didn't have Jan, Jan's like 23. Like, she really was the adult. Jan really helped us out and and held us through the campaign, we asked so much of her because we knew she could handle it because she was older, right? Turns out Jan was also 17. She just never said anything, that she wasn't that much older. She was the same age as them. And so it just, it, they blew them away. It just goes to show even, even they are held back by these restraints that we think young people can't do difficult things. They can't contribute the way that a man can contribute or a woman can contribute who's fully grown and capable. Um, it's just not exactly true. If we can really challenge our youth to do more, they will do more. Um, they asked this question, are you an elephant? Uh, I don't know if everybody knows the story, but elephants, when they're young, they're trained with a rope tied around their ankle. Um, and that rope is... Um, is tied to a stick, right? Um, or maybe, I think it might be a chain when they're young. Um, and they're stuck, and they can't pull that chain off the stick. And um, of years and years, as they grow up, they're just stuck, they're stuck, they're stuck, until they just stop trying. So a rope holds them on that same stick. Um, elephants can literally play tug-of-war with like 100 grown men and win, no problem. And I guarantee you a hundred grown men could take that rope and pull that stake out. But the elephant's blocked by just a mental, uh, a mental block that has been put there and it believes it cannot do that. Uh, it cannot pull that string off. Uh, I actually faced this in athletics um, when I was a wrestler in college. For the first part of my college career, I had a huge mental block. Um, I wasn't able to, to win matches and I really, really struggled. And I won't get into like why I think that mental block was there or anything, but the fact that it was there, I eventually got out of it in my, in my later years of my career, just because I, I think I just matured as a person and as an athlete and those mental blocks went away and I just knew I, I knew I was capable. And so once I knew I was capable, the mental block disappeared, um, the character or the uh, the pillars of their of their program of, of their movement that they're trying to not trying to they crushed it that they moved forward um, is character confidence and collaboration those are the three pillars that they're trying to um, get youth to really grab a hold of and and get into uh, this next phrase the cadult um, is pretty interesting because I've been accused of being a cadult before. Um, but it's someone who is an adult, but has not, but can't really take on any responsibility. The reason I've been accused of being a cadult is because I've been doing my own thing for the last three years, not having a full-time job and 
bouncing around from place to place, not really having a home to live in. Uh, just so we're clear, I'm definitely capable of doing those things. I chose not to, to put a foundation in on something way bigger, way bigger than uh, a full-time job in three years um, building that. And uh, when that foundation holds up what I'm about ready to put together in the next five years, um, I think people will look back and be like, that makes way more sense now. Um, but kidults are people who are perpetually stuck in that state with a, I wouldn't say a fear. I don't, I don't know why they're stuck there. Um, 35, 34, um, living with their parents, not for a purpose, but just because it's easy. Um, there was a guy named Jordan Peterson who was talking about this. Uh, he was talking about maturity levels with, um, with men and, um, in general and how it's a psychological issue. And, um, if it's not dealt with when your father dies, you won't be able to plan the funeral. You'll just be a sobbing mess of nothingness because you haven't, you haven't grown and you haven't hardened yourself, um, not necessarily your heart and your emotions, but as a, as a person dealing with life and responsibility and all the above. Um, fear keeps you trapped in your comfort zone. So maybe, maybe that was what the book was insinuating was, um, it's fear. You're stuck. And you know, that there is something to be said about, um, I, I see this as like a hometown problem. Um, in my, my, my buddy David said this to me, and part of my move uh, out here was to get out of safe waters. And um, I, don't see, I don't see safe waters as living at home. Um, I saw safe waters as living in my home area. You know, Northern California is very, very safe for me. I was, um, I had a place in a, a town called Valley Springs where I grew up. My buddy Josh has a place there and I was uh, renting a room from him there. And my parents lived up in Plymouth and I would crash there every once in a while. And um, I had a, a place out in Lodi that I would stay with a friend uh, every now and then. And then in Sac, my buddy lived in Sac, so I would stay with him every once in a while. And I was bouncing. I had a place in San Francisco that I would stay when I would do shoots out there. And it definitely had a purpose behind it, but it was extremely, extremely safe. Um, safe in the sense of comfortable, meaning I could make money, I could grow my career, and I was being challenged, but challenged for what my buddy David would say, challenged for a normal person, yes. Challenged for you, no. He said, I expect more of you. You need deep waters. You need even a bigger challenge than you're taking on right now. You got to go next level. And I wouldn't say, I don't know if it was fear, but it, for me, it was just a comfort zone. It was like, man, why, why get a full-time job when I know that I'm building something pretty amazing here? And you know, in the last... In the last three years, the things, the foundations that I've been able to lay are pretty, pretty amazing. Um, I, I now have two books published. Um, I got nice foundation work on a startup that hopefully will will roll here pretty soon. I got, um, I'll tell you about when it happens. Um, I, I got my first couple businesses out of the way, started them, made money, shut them down, um, and so. Man, the foundation that I kind of laid and then having all that free drive time, driving back and forth to San Francisco from Sacramento to San Francisco to Fresno to Fresno to L.A. from L.A. back and then to Valley Springs and Plymouth and just doing this triangle thing of all over California and driving, having the opportunity to have windshield time and read and intake 60 books last year um, is so – you can't put a price on it, you know. People don't have time like that to, to, to grow themselves and to help themselves um, expand. Um, but at the same time, if you're stuck there for an extended amount of time, um, I would say I was probably stuck there a year too long. 
Um, I did it for three years. I probably should have stayed around for two. I'm, yeah, I'm, I was gonna say I might have been able to get it done in a, I might have been able to get it done in a year and a half if I knew exactly what I was doing when I started. But when I started, I had no clue what it was. I just knew that I didn't want to work in the same job for the rest of my life. And I wanted to do music, I wanted to do books, I wanted to do art, I wanted to do all these things and I don't know how to accomplish that because I've never done it. And so it was like a good year figuring it out, maybe a year and a half figuring it out, a year laying foundation, and then maybe, I would say after the As You Are tour, I was ready. After the As You Are tour, I was ready to rock. Um, and that ended last summer. So, June. June of 2017, I could have I could have bounced, didn't bounce. July, August, September, October, November, December, January. I stayed seven months too long. You know, I should have had a launch point. Um, and f to be fair, in September I knew I was leaving California. Um, I was already looking for jobs. Um, it was already happening. You know, um, so to be fair, I was already making that move. But I should have been ready. I think the last show was in May, the very first of May too, for the for that tour that we did. So after that, I think the foundation had been laid and I could have bounced out. Um, next deal here. Anything worth doing is worth doing poorly at first. That actually goes into what I just said. You know, those three years, I did them, I did them pretty poorly because I had no clue what I was doing. Um, I'm actually going back to work here uh, full time in the next couple weeks and uh, I'll probably have, the plan is, and the cool thing is now, now I, I know exactly what I'm doing. You know, I'm going to work a full time job for two or three years, five tops. Um, and then now what I'm doing is I'm laying a financial foundation. So I'm choosing to live, uh, I just watched an episode with Gary V, um, some blog that he was talking about. He was talking about people who are my age, who are 30, 32 years old and refusing to go backwards. Oh, you refuse to go backwards. You refuse to live in a place that's not nice. The place I'm living right now, it ain't great. I got a phone. <laughs> you know, I, I don't refuse to go backwards. I'm definitely going backwards from where I could be living with the job that I have, right? The new full-time job that I've, uh, that I've lined up for myself because I'm, I'm back to making significant income, but I'm not going to spend a dime of that income. I'm going to put every single penny of that income into my financial base for investing over the next five years. So, and I'm just going to rent, I'm just going to rent this place, um, dirt cheap rent, dirt, dirt cheap. Even for Missouri, it's dirt cheap. Uh, it's free and awesome. Uh, definitely God hooked it up with this spot. Um, but I'm going to take every penny that I have and put it into my projects. The one thing that I didn't have the last three years was cash to run the projects, but I got the foundation. So now I'm going to work the job. Now when I quit this job the second time, right? Five years, something like that. I don't know. Um, I will have everything in place, the knowledge to operate on my own, and I won't have any lag time in between I quit my job I know I want to do art, I know I want to do music, now what do I do? It's going to be a nice smooth transition to leaving the job right into all the stuff that I had set up for the next couple of years. And as far as I'm concerned, once I quit that job for the second time, I'll never work again or I'll never feel like I'm working because playing music, serving at um, churches and writing books and doing book reads and doing blogs like that, that ain't work, man. This stuff is fun. I love doing this stuff. Um, anything's worth doing poorly, doing it first. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. This was perfect timing for me, driving across America, um, leaving everything that I know for a future that I really don't know. You know, you get a feeling that you should go do something. You get a feeling that this is the right move and not everybody, not everybody's on that same page. Not everybody thinks it's the right move. And there's, there's very select few people in my life who are jazzed about this. And the majority of people think I'm nuts and I like it. I like it that way. You know, um, I'm okay with that because 
Uh, I, there's a method to my madness in every single person that I have talked to who is on the same wavelength with me of where we're going economically as a country, what it's going to mean to be successful in that economic future, how the markets are moving now, and how I think they're going to move in the future. What I'm doing is actually the only way. Um, the only way. Uh, I mentioned it in the last episode. If you have a normal job and you're making $120,000 a year, you got a 30 year mortgage, you got a family, you're saving for retirement, you are the poorest people in America and you won't know it for another 40 years. And it kills me to say that. It kills me to say that because that is me. That is everybody I know. I don't know any rich people. Um, you know, I got a couple friends who are pretty well off, but I don't know any millionaires that I'm hanging out with on a regular basis. I'll say it that way. You know, I got some friends who are doing really, really well. Um, but there's a time frame on their success because of what they're doing. Um, or there is, um, or they're at the tail end of, I have, I have one friend, a friend of a friend, uh, I did a commercial for him back in the day, but he's, uh, he had a company, sold his company, made a book, a bunch of money and now he's looking for his next venture, right? And I think he actually found it. I got to look him up and say what's up to him. <clears throat> but I, I mean, I'm not hanging out with rich people. So it, it kills me to say that because those are my friends. Those are my family. Those are the people I love. But I can't sit them down and say, read these 10 books because you don't have spare time, right? They are raising a family. They're trying to pay their mortgage. They're working their job. How can they sit down and read these 10 books over the course of the next three months? I want you to read these 10 books. Take notes. Tell me your thoughts about our economic future. How is that? I mean, that's why I value those three years of doing nothing so much is because it gave me time to reflect on myself. It gave me time to reflect on what I actually want to do with my life. And it gave me time to read Every single successful person in America, in the world right now, everything that I've read, they say reading, just read. Uh, when I was a freshman in um, high school, I wrestled this guy who was ranked sixth in the state or something like that. I was blown away. I've only been wrestling for a couple of years. I thought it was amazing, right? I know he's sixth in the state. Um, and he just whooped the crap out of me and... I, I asked him, I was very, very humble back then. I'm a conceited prick now. Uh, <laughs> I asked him, hey man, how can I get good? How do I get good? And he said, run. Just go, you gotta run, man. It's conditioning. You just, if I promise you, if you just put your shoes on and run, you'll be good. He wasn't wrong. He wasn't wrong. The week I was cutting weight for the national tournament, uh, my senior year of high school, that was going through my head. Just run. I think I ran, there was a, I actually collapsed while running. I ran 10 miles the week. Um, I didn't collapse from exhaustion. I clapped my legs, just wouldn't run anymore. I ran 10 miles. I ran uh, basically a half marathon. Um, just training, just getting ready to go wrestle a tournament. Uh, those of you who don't know me, I won that tournament. I was a national champ in high school and he wasn't wrong. You just got to run. And I'm telling you right now, if you want to understand everything that is going on around you economically, and it sucks because I can't back this up with results yet. I mean, in five years, I'm going to be able to back it up, but it's so crazy to know exactly. I mean, it's just, mm, I wish I could, I wish I could do it without sounding like I was pontificating upon you from a place of no authority. Um, but man, if you could just read every single day when you hit <clears throat> when you hit like 20 or 40 books, your brain is just going to go and that cloud that I'm talking about, dispersing the cloud, it is going to disappear. It's not going to be there anymore. And you'll be talking a million miles an hour um, and you'll be just ideas running through your head like crazy. <clears throat> so never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Um, this was really cool. God has standards. 
but they're not what you think. Um, I'm, my ministry is hashtag more than rules that I run. I play music and um, I go around telling people about Christ and I play churches and I'm on Spotify and iTunes and all that jazz trying to, trying to tell these people. It's called hashtag more than rules. God has standards, but it's not the standards that you're talking about, right? It's not go to church, read your Bible, do all these other things. It's, it's what they're talking about. It's character, you know? It's confidence. It's collaboration. God has a standard of you to participate in this thing that we call contribution and work and raising a family and being responsible and all these other things. So, um, unfortunately for me, I had to take time in my life to get some of this stuff done, this reading time. These teens are talking about doing it when you're a teen. Um, they spent two summers just reading a gross amount of books um, from, 15, I think it was uh, 16, 16 to 18 before they left for college, right? Um, and so they're doing what I did. God, I'm doing it at 30 years old. Now, obviously, um, I'm dyslexic. I didn't read till I was 23 years old. So I was at a little bit of a disadvantage. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell in the book, David and Goliath, would say it was an advantage and it was a desirable deficiency. It made me the person that I am today, the extrovert and the talker and the go-getter and uh, the person who finds workarounds without having to know how to read. It was a huge asset and I love it and it made me an entrepreneur and it made me someone who, who wants to achieve big things and, and knows how to work around. But the teen years are for growth. The teen years are for knowledge and learning and, and implementing big, big things. This book is for every single teen. Um, if you're a teenager, read it. If you have teenagers, give it to them. If you know a teenager, this is their birthday present. They need to read this book and get at it. Five star book. Um, man, I've been on a roll with five star books lately. Love it. Next week's book is Tap Dancing to Work. It is, I, I believe it's called A Living Biography. Uh, I might be making that up, but I think I like that. A Living Biography because uh, Warren Buffett is still alive, uh, but it is every article that has ever been written about Warren Buffett and then commentary on that. It's a 14-hour read, but I got the spare time. So I'm going to check it out. I'm going to let you guys know all about it. I will see you next week.